architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each week we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker on issues of architecture and architectural thinking. This week I'm talking to my friend and colleague Anthony Polekia, who has had a long and illustrious career uh, beginning in New Jersey and then uh, working with Louis Kahn and KPF. Uh, while also establishing and running his own practice, uh, first in Philadelphia, then in a new iteration in Denver, and then finally as Wesselman Palekia Architects uh, here in Seattle. He's now retired and spends his time uh, not retired from uh, architectural thinking, but simply from uh, uh, professional practice. He's developing a series of conceptual projects uh, imagining the future of architecture, the future of the city, the future of inhabitation itself. I talked to him about his life and career and his speculative projects. It's a fascinating conversation and I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Well, welcome to Architecture Talk, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, so, Anthony, you, you, you live here in Seattle and in Port Townsend. And now you are uh, the author of a fascinating and interesting, uh, I would describe this as a conceptual practice, mm -hmm. which involves uh, art, uh, architecture, some writings, and open-ended uh, speculations on the future of cities uh, and architectural thinking. But uh, this comes as part of, and uh, you know, at towards the end of this uh, illustrious career, I would say. Uh, <laughs> starting off, uh, I think uh, you grew up in uh, New Jersey in Hoboken, and uh, then you uh, uh, practiced in uh, Philadelphia, working with Ghan, and uh, then on your own. And then you joined the sort of still mid-sized firm of uh, KPF. Uh, probably fairly large now. Now, now of course, KPF's huge, but at that time, I don't think. No, no, yeah, there, there were, were 40 people. 40 people, yeah. and then you practiced uh, again on your own in Colorado, in Denver. Yes. And uh, that's from Denver, we got you here in Seattle. Uh, where you had Wesselman Palekia Architects with Kathy, your wife. Associates, but we uh, did both graphic design and architecture. Graphic design and architecture right. and sort of a um, intermingled practice. Right. And uh, now both of you are retired and doing your own things. Yeah, what we like to say is we retired WPA. Okay, but so you're not retired. Both of us continue to work. Continue to work, own work, but but doing your own own things. Yes. So so let's start with your 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 thing. What are you working on? You're working on a series of uh, speculative projects on the future of the city and some paintings. These, from what I remember from a presentation I attended of yours, rec uh, some uh, recently at Rob Hutchinson's. Uh, imagine another kind of living, another kind of city uh, in the air. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it's just a, you know, a, another expression of various uh, ideas that uh, have existed for many years. I mean, you have the Japanese were, you know, Isusaki and, and others were doing uh, designs above Tokyo. You had, and then there were other iterations. Uh, right. You know, discovered metabolists, uh, for sure. The metabolists, yeah. yes, yeah. and uh, definitely. And you had Cook, Peter Cook, and, and yeah. his cohorts. And then, then you had Graham, yeah. Archie Graham, and then you had, uh, you know, in some respects, you had Corbu, you know, and then you could. So they weren't in the air, but yeah. they were large structures. They were sort of uh, 
that dealt with the kind of density and a relationship with the landscape that um, was, I think, was critical mm -hmm. in uh, a division, of a separation between how people thought about how humans would live. Right? Um, my thinking has to do with, and I think it's at an appropriate time because her environment is shambles, you know, shambles and it, our conditions are, are, we don't have a lot of time to right, right. deal with the issues. And so I think that some big ideas and some big thoughts need to be put into it. And, um, and I think that the density is important. I think we need to control where, how we relate to nature. Yeah. So the idea, the concept of building above what exists, yeah. right? So you're proposing these sort of cities which kind of float, not float, well, but are suspended in the air. Yeah, they're, I mean, these skyways, if skyways, you will. Skyways, yes, you know. yes. And, um, long skyways, yeah, very dense, long skyways. Right, with some large... At least 20 stories high, tall, uh, above easily, the ground. Easily, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, part of that has then, it is important because it, and different, it doesn't destroy what exists mm. on the ground plane. So the idea is to uh, leave the ground plane pristine. Well, eventually, yeah. the ground plane would, we'd then we would do this for, in one consideration, we'd do it in relationship to realizing that we have other creatures that are... are, are share the earth. Share the earth rather than us dominating it. Well, yeah. we'll 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 be we're encroaching on the birds. Uh, we're well, but uh, the birds uh, <laughs> can still be in the trees, and they'll fly up to the uh, and and join us. You know, join the humans up yeah, there yeah. and build nests, and that that won't be a problem for the birds. So they also a, live in. I discovered with it being out in Port Townsend that many birds live on the ground plane in in bushes and actually build nests in the ground too. So, it's it, they're very interesting creatures. Well, okay, but, but anyway, I, I so just see that living in the air does have a Icarus quality. Yes, oh yes. The other aspects of the design is that it's very intentionally not a grid. It's, mm. the, the geometry is very irregular and it varies considerably. And Why? There are two reasons. One, I think the grid and its origins are basically for land ownership, and the purchase of land. Right. Okay. So this is so against I, property. This ownership. is against property ownership. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. This is not a new idea. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not crediting you with yeah. new ideas. No, no. I'm just crediting yeah. you mean, with interesting ideas. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so there's that aspect of it. Of it. And the other thing is, is that no, but it's more than just defining property. I mean, all the right, that's where look, your drawings are so rich. Yeah. yeah. They have. They. they potentially sustain a rich kind of a I'm different also, kind of a life. also concerned about um, the fact that we've lost public spaces. Hmm. You know, we keep so much of what is being built. And it would be interesting to understand the percentage of construction that has taken place since this, from the 70s to today uh -huh. versus that same amount of time prior to that. Right. Okay. Uh, because I think that that uh, that was probably be an interesting statistic, but to get back to the, the the various configurations of these sort of images that exist above the ground plane, um, what they they're purposefully not specific in in uh, consistent geometry, mm. so that spaces can be found and not demanded as commercial space by developers. So you allow any program in any space? Well, I'm trying No to, zoning? Well, yeah, I'm not that interested in zoning. I think zoning needs to be totally reconsidered. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that plus, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think zoning um, is way outdated and unfortunately... Um, so city, what's your replacement proposal for zoning? I don't know. I haven't thought of it. I mean, this is very. All of this is very complex, and it would require yeah. uh, a variety of people to participate in it, not yeah, just yeah. me or other architects, yeah, but yeah. planners, landscape architects, scientists. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an interesting. I'm reading uh, the sixth uh, extinction, and there are the, these coral reefs yeah. that grow and and support themselves and so on, which right. are in trouble. Uh, they support hundreds of thousands of living creatures. Right. So there's this, you know, this 
sympathetic relationship that yeah. the coral reef has with all these other things, unlike yeah. humans. Yeah, yeah, we keep things out. We, yeah, we, we destroy. We and, destroy. Yeah, and eliminate. So do you think of this like this massive coral reef in the sky? Well, I mean, that's a, the, the similarity is only that it, it allows other living creatures to exist, coexist on the portions of the land that we took away from them. Mm. So we kind of leave where they are by going above. Now obviously there'll need to be connections and there'll be some density on the ground, but not to the degree that exists today. What is the origin of this deep sympathy for the non-human in your work? I mean, are you very it's partial to animals or? Oh yeah, I you? am, yeah. Where but does this come from? It's, it's just a, it's a fairness. It has to do with a, sure, but why a belief that, uh, oh, also, it, maybe it's a belief that, uh, that, um, that the human race is not superior, that man is. Why do you think that it's not superior? Ooh. We can think, come on. I'm, so, I'm, I'm not so can other other creatures. I mean, uh -huh, uh -huh. Can, you know, we haven't. Uh, we're finally taking time, spending time. It's fairly, you know, Darwin. I mean, was was the breakthrough, mm. right, of understanding the ability that other creatures have, and we're continuing to learn more and more about them. But right. the other, the downside of it is, is that the human race is uh, uh, historically not the uh, best example to model uh, yeah. the future, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. You yeah. know, non-human so. species are, are diverse and rich and, and have all kinds of abilities. This idea that uh, the only species that matters is human and everything else is property yeah, is yeah. Uh, extremely I, damaging. I think another aspect that architects need to be aware of, and many are, but we're not this uh, isolated profession. You know, I understand that, you know, I've had clients, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that realization. But if, if we decide to do what I've, some of the current things that mm -hmm. I've been thinking about, society needs, all aspects of society needs to participate in it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not going to be realized. That not not even the the form it's in, but just the th the thinking and the possibility of something like that taking place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so we are very much uh, a part of uh, the rest of society, sure. and and I think that relating back to an interest in in the amount of construction that took place from say the 70s and 80s to today, uh, there's a concern I have, and I realized it went back in the 70s going from. Philadelphia back to New York and going from a, my own firm and uh, Marshall and my firm and then cons and and then going to a larger firm that was doing a lot of corporate headquarters right you know you become there's a danger of of the architect becoming a kind of service rather than a, a, a builder right a maker of things mm. you know to where and this is where Khan was unique I right. think in that he was given programs, but he he studied the program to, uh, and it wanted to understand the nature of it right. and the institutional aspect of it. Right. And therefore, he sort of incorporated other aspects of the design mm -hmm. that in, increased the the program. You know? So there were various spaces and aspects of the of the design that he brought to it that wasn't given to him by an owner. Yeah, right? I mean, he thought of architecture as the work of constructing the edifice of which the client and the program were only a part. I mean, it was a contribution to, to, to life. life. Life, society. Too, society right, right? and life. Yes, yes. Beyond society, right, and right, right. just uh, life itself. Right. I mean, it seems to me when I look at the, your drawings and your paintings and your sort of these dense uh, non-orthogonal proposals for mm. cities in the air, it does remind me of uh, European towns and old Indian towns and, uh, uh, and Arab, know, yes. Arabic towns yeah, yes. and uh, 
So it's, it's, it seems decisively anti-modern, if, if I may say so. Well, as, you know, I mean, you know that I'm interested in, in history. Yeah. Uh, history of architecture. And, and now we have the, an and now we ha I have had an opportunity to study um, architecture from other parts of the world other mm -hmm. than uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're, you're exactly right. I mean, the configurations of, I'm really um, enamored with um, medieval uh, towns uh, and then the horizontal um, sort of plans that exist in Arab countries and in India, you yeah. know, and so on. I mean, it, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, th they had different criteria. Right. You know, so, so again, you have, one has to understand the, the socioeconomic aspect of those cultures yeah. to understand further how, why the architecture is the way it is. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. which I, you know, continue to believe we, we need as architects spend more time understanding what's going on today. And Do you have a good is. memory, a distinctive memory when you were in a non-gridded town and something struck you and you said, you said aha, was there an aha moment connected with urban experience and in a European city? Probably or in the else? older, uh, well, there, yes, there, there is. I mean, I'm enamored with, um, again, the, the non-gridded, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, where the automobile dominated a plan of an urban right. uh, place. And so there's a distinctive difference between um, linear movement and more centralized movement. And mm -hmm. you can think of Palermo, you can think of Rome, you could think of many old cities that where you have these great spaces that people gather in and then you have other spaces where it tightens up and people are moving linear, you know, in a linear, linear manner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a variety of spaces that one is moving through and right. they do different things in them. Right. Today we're, you know, we're burdened by the automobile and the sidewalk and the street, right. you know, and it's repetitious. And then beyond that, we have commerce, you know, and it becomes, again, repetitious. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it, uh, so I, I think that we, particularly in this country, um, we, uh, we don't have the history that uh, other places and other parts of the world have. Right. You know? I mean, it seems to me, you know, this is, uh, you're talking, referring to Italian towns and, uh, you know, Sicilian towns, Italian towns. Uh, and that, of course, connects to your heritage. I know you're born and brought up in your uh, hobo Italian. Hobo. Yeah, so yeah. this is where I'm going. There's yeah. a, a big difference between uh, Palermo and uh, where you grew up, Hoboken. Absolutely. Yeah. And is that is that the dialogue in your head, like Palermo versus Hoboken, to put it in a shorthand? No, no. I mean, I think the, the one similarity mm -hmm. may be the, the the urban aspect of it. I mean, they're yeah, but you are you're critiquing the grid of uh, Hoboken, no? Yes, yes. It's definitely the, the grid of the automobile. The and, grid of the automobile, and, and, the grid of the private land property. Ownership, yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so I don't I haven't lived in Hoboken for years. <laughs> I didn't choose <laughs> do, that. Do, as do, much. Are you dis, do you choose to distance yourself from Hoboken? Well, there's no nothing there any longer right, for me to remain there. Right. Right. And but you were once telling me that Peter Smithson came to your office in Philadelphia and when he found out that you were from Hoboken, what did he say? Well, he, was, he thought it was the, sort of one of the worst places he had ever been. So would you agree? No. <laughs> yeah, I thought but, not. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't aware um, that I, w I grew up in came from such what was perceived by other people mm -hmm. that Hoboken was such a terrible place in their minds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in fact, even uh, afterwards when we were in, I was in Philadelphia and Marshall and I had our office, yeah. um, Smithson came, visited our office because we were working on the Yale Center and he was teaching th there that semester. Mm -hmm. And um, somehow we got talking about where we were from and <coughs> I mentioned Hoboken. And, yeah. uh, yeah, he was horrified. Horrified? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, of how awful a place it was. And I don't know how he ever 
experience, did he? Maybe, you know, it used to, ships used to dock there and leave from there. I so mean, Peter Smithson in London right, thinks right. that Hoboken yeah, is, 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 like is the, the dumps. It was, yeah, you know, a little, yeah, I'm leaving, you know, the ass end of the, of the <laughs> United States. And so, but anyway, um, so, but it was when I went to the University of Illinois that there was, it had this reputation that I was unaware of because, you know. You just um, thought it was home. Well, it was home, but also I lived in, a, you know, I had a very ideal situation. I mean, my, it was the whole, so three generations were living in this four-story building. Yeah. Um, and uh, my aunt and uncle lived on the first floor. Multi-generational yes, living. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so um, um, we lived on the second. My grandparents and uncle lived on the third, and they rented the fourth floor. And all the food came from my grandmother because everyone else worked. But that's the what the, this, the waspy so, world thought was like, you know, the, the Italians just crowding the place. Right. Well, you know, and so there, that, that's an interesting point, okay, right. that, ex, that I take into, um, that I'm aware of today. Yeah. And I think one of our problems that we have that has been uh, magnified yeah. in that um, there's this division between uh, the people who think they're Americans, and I was reminded in Italy at a museum once in Sicily when I mentioned that I was from America, and he said, North or South? Uh huh. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. No, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, know yeah. that. Okay, a little side. <laughs> but that's but, a little different. Well, yes, that's yeah. another issue. Yeah. But there is this cultural thing that um, somehow the group of people who consider themselves Americans. Yeah. Uh, have forgotten where they came from. Yeah, you know they've left that culture. Yeah, you know behind. Yeah. and there are those of us who don't want to forget it, who have taken it, brought us here. Mm -hmm. You know from our past, yeah. our ancestors. Yeah, and uh, and we're made up. When you look at what this country is culturally, yeah. it's a combination of cultures from all over the world. Right, and that's its greatness. That is its greatness. That's its virtue. You but know. it's a long-standing conflict between okay. that as its greatness right. versus those who believe that its greatness lies in a sort of a singular right. origin. And so I've resisted, um, to become more personal about it, I've resisted um, making that transformation, you know, and becoming, I'm going to say white, okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, Simplistic term, right? Right, and I want to retain that uh, that history and that connection, so because I believe that that's way that's the way the whole world is. Yeah, we we shouldn't have the divisions. We shouldn't we have. have the divisions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and 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 multicultural right. America makes it a richer and better America. Right, absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, it uh, you know that's. Okay, yeah. Let's talk about Grounded Angel, yeah. 1992, I think. Yes. It's a beautiful project. Uh, it kind of uh, imagines a, a trough, a kind of like a floating mummy case there in the are, air. There are a lot of references to uh, Egyptian and Viking, you know, vessels, and yes, I mean. But it, it contains uh, toxic waste. Yes. It was at a, it was a large. Uh, there was a very significant conference in Denver at the time, and uh, primarily uh, attended by scientists who were concerned about how uh, toxic waste of all forms was being stored. And um, there were a number of articles um, in various journals about the uh, the possibility of a thousand years from now someone excavating an area and. There they find uh, toxic Uran waste that's toxic still waste. Uranium, uh, dangerous. Yeah, uranium I mean, you know, still you know, still decaying. And so one of the I was interested in in sort of having an influence on uh, making people aware of uh, of of this condition. So why put it in a mummy? Well, I wanted to get it out of the ground mm -hmm. because in the ground it's it's it invisible out of and it sight, out of out, exactly. Exactly, and and this was also the one of the, you know, the, what was uh, what the scientists were talking about because what mm -hmm. they were had a lot of this waste in was deteriorating. 
and it then was getting in the in the ground in the in the water and, and so on mm -hmm. and um, and there happened to be a large site that contained a lot of uh, of this waste mm -hmm, it would be mm -hmm. in, right next to the airport in in Denver right which that land was going to be annexed and turned into a variety of uh, it was all going to be so, so you wanted to renewal complex. put it into the public eye. So I wanted eye. to get it above the ground. I wanted it to be on display, and mm -hmm. I wanted it to be in a sort of symbolic uh, image, mm -hmm. and I wanted it to be seen from the air also. And so um, it's 300 feet long, a uh, length of a football field, mm -hmm. you know, so it has some, uh, some scale to it. Mm -hmm. you know, it's translucent. At night, it would uh, glow. Mm -hmm. You know, there's another sort of uh, reference there. Glow because of the uh, toxic well, stuff inside, no, or you would make it glow? I would. It would. It would be illuminated so yeah. that it were visible. Right. Uh, the and then the other aspect of it is is that it sits in these um, glass vessels that mm. are uh, or have references to um, exotic oils that Romans uh, would store there. You know. This, these, these precious oils in, mm. you know, and so there's a lot of historical references so that it, the symbolism of it has some connection to previous societies and, and iconography. Right. Um, but it sort of has an ironic quality to it in the sense that, uh, you know, putting this in the air and then in these vessels which were used for perfumes, you know, sort of says, but we've got toxic waste in there. Right, but at the same time, the scientists were, had determined that the best way to store a lot of the, the, this material was in glass vessels rather than metal. I see, why? Uh, because the glass wouldn't deteriorate. Unlike metal. Unlike metal, yes. And obviously there was a thickness to it, and you know, so that was. So I didn't, I didn't make that up. That was something that I, you know, I learned from mm -hmm. reading and uh, one of the discussions in the conference. So it was a three-day conference. I got interested in it. I happened to attend it, and uh, that sort of started the whole thing. But it was also my interest as an architect to sort of step beyond the program that one is given by a client and try to influence and express various I issues that are you know, critical at the time. Because I think if we only do the work that we're given, and so much of it is commercial, you know, I mean, I, I think probably most of the construction that took place in that era that I was talking about was, is commercial. Mm. You know? Did it have influence? No. I mean, n I wasn't alone in that. The scientists, <laughs> who were much more significant than me, didn't mm -hmm. e even have much influence. Did you it. show it to the scientists? No, but I, it was on. It did. Uh, was, it was in an exhibition at um, at the University of uh, Colorado. Um, that um, you know, had a number of other um, architectural pieces in it. Yeah. Why do you think it's important for architects to do work like this? Practicing architects. Well, because I don't think anyone else in society is thinking about the environment other than for profit, for the most part. No, architects are thinking about the environment, but they're designing, you know, LEED certified sustainable building. Yeah, and that's a good point. I mean, I, you know, I think that, um, and that's important. I'm not criticizing yeah, yeah. No, that. No. However, it, it may not be architecture. I mean, it, it's, I think, I think in relationship to this technological sort of development that's taken place that coincides with the amount of construction that we've been doing, right? There's been a lot of interest in the, the technology of, of making, and that sort of dominated the concerns that maybe someone like Kahn or mm -hmm. Wright had. Right? So it's very much a late 20th century sort of attitude. And it's, it's t it really is sort of connected to the various aspects of modernism and, uh, and rationality. You know, um, I mean, I think a lot of American business people um, welcomed rationalism 
because they could get rid of all of that costly decorative uh, you know, parts of uh, architecture of buildings and get down to only building what they could lease you know, and mm -hmm. make money from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I tend to think, you know, with my interest in fashion, that, uh, you know, big fashion houses will put up two, one or two, sh you know, runway shows every year. And nobody wears that stuff. But it, they are sort of really conceptual designs. Uh, and then exactly. the rest of the year, then they put out the stuff that's going to be purchased. So that right. kind of a relationship between, you know, something that's produced uh, for the market and yet at the same time something that's publicly presented I th I as, as conceptual is missing in our... A, exactly. It's a perfect example. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's such a loss. We just don't tend to do it. In the old days... You know, people like Cedric Price or uh, Lydia's Woods or, uh, or or the Smithsons even right, or even right. Corbusier yeah. uh, were publishing uh, you know conceptual projects all the time. Yes. How did this all? Uh, well, I think why that's, did why did this get to be devalued in the uh, architecture community? I, I do I do think that in the '60s and '70s there was a transformation that took place. <laughs> I, you know, I think you had the military um, events that occurred in mm -hmm. the First World War and then followed by the Second World War and how the impact that that had on various uh, parts of you know, societies throughout the world. And, mm -hmm. and uh, in the United States, of course, we had this um, enormous military machine that we developed during mm -hmm. this, particularly the Second World War that needed to go someplace, right? And you had all of this money that had already been made from it. Um, and, um, and you had a group of people that were coming back from the, uh, the war that wanted houses and so on, and all of this then gets uh, commercialized by uh, investors in the business community. At the same time, I mean, even Eisenhower warned us about the, the military industrial, industrial complex, complex yeah. right? You know, and so, and here we are with uh, it probably dominating the biggest part of our budget in the United States. And then you look at other parts of the world, other countries, and the same thing is taking place. I so mean, what's the, how, why did architects stop doing conceptual practice with that? Well, I think they got so enamored, they got so involved in all of this other work that was They got seduced on. by the they money. They did. They, well, they got seduced by the projects. I mean, I think some by the money, but others yeah, by the, well, the mean, desire to build, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, most architects who, you know, you wind up designing more buildings that, that don't get built than those that do but get built. But I still built. So hear architects complaining about, well, you know, I, I don't get to do the work that I want to be doing, you know, so why don't they that's true. do conceptual work? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> they need to step up and maybe that's maybe what they want. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's what, one of the interesting things now is that we both Kathy and I are finally doing the work that we... We used to do it at night and yeah. on weekends. Now we can do it seven Full days time. a week, right? Yes. Let's talk about Frank Lloyd Wright. He was a conceptual design man. I mean, he had extensive practice, but he never shirked from uh, establishing other projects, so Mile High Towers right. and uh, Broadacre, Broadacre Cities City, and, yes. and so on. Uh, uh, you you were quite uh, influenced by Wright. No? I was, yeah. And I, we, you know, I think the it's unfortunate that um, he, in maybe twenty years ago, maybe I can't really pin down the date, but he became considered a nineteenth-century architect. Yes, you know, and that sort of instead he, of a futurist, right, right, yeah. right. Well, or even a contemporary. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's kind of like he dated. Just, he, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Why? Why did that happen? Well, I think this this amount of construction and the technology and uh, you know the, the sort of uh, economic investment just dominated um, mm. the profession. Right? And what I, was lost? What was right about to you? Well, I think there's a connection between Kahn and Wright. I think that although Kahn is re still revered, mm. there's a, there is still a segment of the profession. Uh, for a variety of reasons that um, don't uh, look at his work uh, the what's way the, maybe you and I do. What's the connection between Wright and Kahn? Everybody well, talks about Kahn and Korb, but 
not that much about well, crime. Well, that's Car probably a personal thing because I went from being interested in Wright and seeing his work before I was went to Khan and mm -hmm. looked at his work. I mean, I think there's this um, this cultural. Thing. I mean, Wright was about an, uh, an architecture, an American architecture, if you will, uh -huh. something that was coming from you know, what this country was supposed to be. Which is what? Well, I mean, uh, the frontier, right, and uh -huh. the sort of the landscape and. Uh -huh. And the making of things. Okay. And, you know, if you if you tend, you go to Wright's buildings. I mean, they were serious structures and materials were beautifully put together. Uh -huh. um, and I think there were there are aspects of Wright's buildings that where the where he introduced other program into the programs that he was given. Mm -hmm. There are aspects of his designs for uh, the Johnson Wax building was. A, the, you know, the columns and the yeah, yeah. capitals and, and great sort of spaces for people to work in, you know. And the Guggenheim with the central space. Mm -hmm. He wasn't asked to do a building like that. That was some, the concept of it had also went beyond what the program, what he was given. Mm. You know. so, yeah, uh, certainly, yeah. He thought of his work as uh, contributive to an, uh, an articulation of what he thought life uh, and culture and society could be, ought right. to be, should be, uh, as did Khan. Right. But this is exactly the things that the modernists got raked over the coals about for being too prescriptive and utopian. Do you think that was all misplaced? No, uh, of course not. I'm, in a <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm doing the same thing they did. So, no, I think too little of it is done, and yeah. uh, I think uh, we've become too materialistic. Yeah. You know, and you know, it takes us back to what we've done at the same time. We, in my lifetime, less than my lifetime, since 1950 to today, the population of the United States has doubled. The population of the Earth has tripled. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we continue to use up the natural resources to build more and more and more, and most of it is built for profit. Right. So there's, I think, a, that's a significant problem. I think we need to step back and understand what we're doing. Mm. And that you need the sort of distance and vision of a person. You need independence. Yeah. And it concerns me that um, that more of this type of thinking doesn't take place in academia. You know, I think that we're, um, you know, I've been away from it for a while and I never really haven't taught full time since uh, 74. So mm. it's always usually, you know, t part time. But um, right now there's, a, you know, the offices today, they want people to come from school knowing all of the computer programs. And, right. You know, the, so which is very different than when I went to school and when I got out of school. I mean, there was this uh, sort of apprenticeship attitude that offices had. Mm. Not just good offices, all offices had. Right. The idea that you came out of school, you they, would, they had a responsibility to teach you certain things that they would focus on. Right. And the way they ran their office, right? That's sort of disappeared, and it's disappeared a long time ago, but it's very prevalent today. And it's almost like a, it's a trade school. No, I agree. That. Certainly there's that sense to it. But it's the industry that's demanding it. It's not some, you know, and the schools are under pressure. Yes, know. of course, yeah, and, and rising cost of tuition. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's right. through the roof, right. uh, and that puts a huge amount of pressure. Right. Both on students, of course, but also on you know uh, how we teach. Right, and so that's the. Uh, that's By contrast, Khan, uh, you know, you were telling me he took no salary and lived off his uh, academic uh, uh, salary. Well, he didn't consider architecture business. Yeah, in some respects, you know, particularly when we talk about it, that aspect of it. It probably wasn't the best place to work for so long. Oh, it was the best place. <laughs> but I mean in relationship to knowing how to run an office, right? <laughs> no, but what we are talking about it is what does it mean to run an office? Right, yeah. I mean, one definition of run an office is to maximization of profit. 
the other definition of run an architectural practice is something else. Well, you mentioned profit. I never had a line item of like of profit. You didn't. No. You Even had WPA to didn't have a line item of profit. You drew a salary. We drew a salary. Yeah. But we did work for that salary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it wasn't what was left over. We would go ahead and take. Right. You know, we would put most of it back into the firm if there was something. I mean, usually. I'd be happy before WPA that I made my salary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there were years when I didn't. Yeah. But, you know. But Khan had a kind of a uh, monastic, is that right? Monastic sense of purpose in his work. How do you mean? Like a monk. He worked in his office, this as a devotion to God. And we were, yeah, we could probably say we were, uh, you know, you were all minor like, monks. You were all minor, yeah, you were. Uh, we were all uh, as dedicated. Novice, or, what are the, there's a, there's a cler clerical term for yes, this. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, nov nov novices? Or what, Believers, no, uh, maybe, I don't, yeah, don't know. Yeah. No, I know, uh, I know. Yeah. Monks in training. Yes, 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 monks in training, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we uh, we we worked um, there at times without being paid. Was there a uh, just because of my interests? Was there a implicit dress code ever? Oh no, no, no. Um, the people that worked in Khan's office not only did they come from different cultures and different parts of the world, but they also came from different uh, economic groups. And mm. so most of us were either they they either were middle income or or lower income, and some maybe were you know, higher income, but it was a very diverse group of people, mm -hmm. unlike the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century when it was very much a, you know, a gentleman's profession. Right, right. Um, How did that diversity play into the work or office culture? Well, I think because we were primarily not from you know, we were, were those, we were workers, mm. you know, everybody helped one another. I mean, there were 25 people basically in the firm doing, and Khan was doing tremendous amount of work. Yeah. And we, not only did we work long hours, but we, you'd have a senior person working on a project and got a, got a gap and they would go help someone else uh -huh. uh, do something, you know, just to get the project along. Right. Uh, I'd work on, I worked on Exeter for Witten Scott, he was in charge of that project and worked mm. on the library and, and worked on uh, the jack arches and uh, one of the complex stairs, you know. So, and I was in charge of uh, Fort Wayne at the time. Mm. Uh, so everybody sort of helped one another. So there was no sort of meticulous record keeping of Billable hours. Oh no! Oh no! We all had uh, no. We kept definitely kept our hours because we our hours were billed. Yeah. It was Khan's hours that weren't billed. I see. Yeah. yeah no, no. We had uh, we had timesheets. Right. Oh yeah. Who else did you you know encounter as uh, amongst the modernists? Uh, did you meet uh, Buckminster Fuller or any of the other big I, Americans? I, I, I attended a lecture. That uh, that Fuller gave at the University of Illinois, uh -huh. and uh, it was uh, it was advertised as uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller and the Movable Wall, <laughs> and uh, he saw that poster for it when he arrived. Uh -huh. He was down in Southern Illinois, yeah. and uh, came up and says, "No, no, no, that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about." My architecture in relationship to Einstein's theory of relativity. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was there with a couple of good friends, and um, if the auditorium was full, mm. and it went on one hour, two hours, three hours. The lights were kind of dim. People, students three were hours? leaving, continuing to leave. He'd walk back and forth, talking. No, not a lot of images, a lot of discussion or a lot of this explanation of his work. And, and Three, four hours? Four of hours. And there was a, some of us still left. That was about it. After he didn't four. care how many people were I don't know if he could see us. He couldn't see very well at that. You know, he had glasses that were, oh. uh, were pretty thick. And, and, uh, so that's a strategy. 
<laughs> but we were some of us were mesmerized, you know, mesmerized yeah. uh, about his uh, sort of directness yeah. and saying, "No, that's not what I'm going to talk about." And then go on and on and on and on, and uh, it was quite interesting, you know. And and I did learn. I mean, I mean, he knew he on he, he would weigh he he calculate the weight of of his buildings. You mm -hmm. know? And I used to do the same thing, and I definitely did it at WPA. You calculated the, the weight all the of metal it. And that we would use, and where it would, what sheets it would come from, how you know, how would we, how could, how could we maximize the amount of material coming out of the various sheets of material? But or did you weigh your building? Do you know how much weigh, your house weighs? N n no, what? but I did, would do portions of it. Yeah. But I never sort of put it all together. But we had an opportunity when we were doing the architectural uh, graphics because the objects were small. Mm -hmm. And there was another uh, aspect to it. We needed to make sure that they were mechanically attached so that they could be modified, they could, information could be changed and so on. You know? So uh, we did do some houses at that through with, with WPA. We did a uh, large uh, transformation of a large public space from a vehicular way to a pedestrian way at Washington State University. So we had, we had opened WPA with the hope that we would do both architecture and graphic design. And so, but we were, it was interesting that we were able to detail everything to such finite terms, mm -hmm. you know, and be responsible for how they were going to be made. Right, 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 know, right. And insist that they be made that way because of s certain things that the fabricators wouldn't consider. I mean, this is sort of the fascinating and unusual thing about when I look at your drawings about these urban scapes in the air, is that these are super massive projects, right? These are huge constructions imagined. Right. Uh, but at the same time, you're using a very craft, craftsmanly kind of attitude to their drawings. I mean, they are like artworks. They are meticulously kind of drawn with precision and loving care. Uh, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's this paradox. Uh, it isn't if you grew up when I did and went to Khan's office when I did and his interest and in demand of the quality of drawings. Well, know, what was that about? Why, was, why did he demand that? His interest in everything he did. It needed to sort of be done at a high level. Why was the quality of drawing famously such a because big thing in Khan's office? You know, it was through the drawing and the over and over the repetition of and tracing and tracing over and over and over again that the 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 architecture was discovered. It's that was that process, and not that he would use that word, but it was that way of searching. And drawing was very important. Is that what you're doing? It's definitely what I do. Uh, there's a dialogue between. Uh, me and a piece of paper um, and a pencil or pen that um, there's a sort of e uh, equality that where I don't attempt to demand what I what I wind up what the paper winds up bringing back I, at times the paper I, talks to you it, well it mean hopefully what I'm doing and how I'm thinking allows me to step beyond my own Know, and allow something else to enter. So I see a line move and meet another line and you know um, and from that I discover uh, but maybe I wasn't thinking about where I was. I did, it wasn't a preconceived, a predetermined configuration, mm. right? And so it sort of gets found through this uh, method of working. It's like, uh, you know, the line has its own, yes. own life, viva, right, right. It's, it's, it's aliveness, which sort of connects to what you were saying earlier about having respect for all forms of life, and not just animal life right. and bird life, right. but in a sense the ethic comes material. from having material life right. too. Right. Things, right. materials have life. Right. I mean, that was exactly. Khan's famous right. statement, right. asking the brick what it wants to be. Yes, yeah. It's yeah. kind of a little bit of respect for the brick. It is, it is. I mean, it's, I'm smiling because <laughs> I, um, I, I purposely kept away from his 
verbal language mm. because it was so personal. Mm. You know, I mean, he, I mean, only someone like Lou Kahn could make the statement, I asked a brick what it wanted to be, and it told me <laughs> it wanted to be an arch, right? I mean, I could never say that in, without smiling, right? You know, or be, you be, just be, said, be, be considered, you know, it's serious. You right? saw the line, no, no. Uh, hang out with another line, yeah, and then they well, spoke to you. That, that, but that's, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, um, it, it was a very personal language. Mm. And um, and I understood that, and I understood the danger of being enamored with it and seduced by it. However, I was seduced by him watching him draw. You know, really? And yeah. Oh, sure. Because and he did it constantly. And you know, everyone who worked there and worked with him talked about he needed to talk to someone, so he always was drawing when someone was there. But we were there. But he was very much internally involved with what he was doing. I see. Yeah. There was this, this So dialogue. why was that seductive? Well, to see the line sort of move from this quietness and then from words that are being, were being asked or said, and then the lines were somewhat different in some way. You know, they had their own life. Yeah. There, there were words that had a life, and then there were the images on the paper that had a life. Yeah. And I focused on the images on the paper and the movement that took place on the paper. It sort of reminds me of uh, Jackson Pollock uh, dropping paint, yeah. which had its own kind of right, life. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's a sort of uh, an ability to um, accept the material as an equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, again, back to the sort of having, yeah. it's not only multi-species respect, but multi uh, material of the having respect for the otherness of everything you know most of Khan built Khan's buildings were built of very modest materials mm. you know, concrete block mm. brick yeah sure I mean we had stainless steel yeah. you know, and travertine but um, you know concrete uh, concrete's a very modest material mm. you know, um, and so there I have a, a learned a respect for um, simple materials Maybe there's a sort of uh, connection with a socioeconomic connection there where you don't have uh, um, two hierarchies, you know, what's good and what's not so good. You know? So you, you, you don't look down or, or you're not negative towards a simple material because it isn't glamorous and, it, and you can use it and it has a, a, a purity to it. Mm. because of its simplicity, like concrete block. Right. Right. As we move towards the end over here, I, I, you know, I must insist on coming back to, because I hear this sort of democratizing kind of impulse in a lot of the things that you're describing, uh, and sort of respect for the, let's say, the ordinary and the simple and the underdog and the everyday, yeah. I mean, I can't help thinking, you know, this has to uh, go back to a sense of uh, uh, habilitating respect for the very ordinary of the Hoboken, you know, versus the grand greatness of Paris or right, uh, right, right. or Manhattan or, uh, you know, or anything. Isn't it, is that a... It, there is a, there's a specific connection. I mean, we were, um, my... Uh, my aunt and uncle um, were in the garment industry okay. and cousins, and um, I spent time working with them. My mom was a seamstress, mm -hmm. and uh, I would work late at night when I was in high school with my cousins, piling up fabric, and they would cut it. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And so we'd see these, this transformation of these flat, irregular, what looked like irregular pieces of material. Yeah. Right? Uh, and then d delivered to uh, the seamstresses and, and uh, turned into three-dimensional garments. Yeah. Right? Well, you put into fashion early. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have some interesting stories which we won't go into today. But, uh, <laughs> Too bad. We should we'll, have started well, there. we'll have a drink and a cigar later on. Sometime. Yeah, yeah. I so, mean, yeah. Uh, but, um, and my grandfather, my mom's dad, um, came from Sicily. Uh, what his dad and he did there was make architectural clay products. Yeah, yeah. And then when he was in the United States, he was a furniture maker and he restored antiques. So there was this involvement 
of making things, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I think from that young, that being exposed to it at a very young age, yeah. um, I got very in influenced by it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The great love I of think that's making, the connection. It, making yeah. the ordinary. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure talking the to you, Anthony. Thank you for coming out. Same here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash, your host, and our producer is the one and only Sammy Prouty, a graduate student of architecture here at the University of Washington in Seattle. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation, and if you did, please do take a moment to subscribe and to rate us on iTunes. See you next time. Take care. Goodbye.